Good. So once again, I'm not checking email. I just uh, jotted down my notes here. Um, good. So um, can we also get a, a timer? Because otherwise, this will go certainly on for, for a long time. So one question I wanted to ask all of you is that I think we've, we've spoken about um, you know, issues that are being discussed. And this panel is called AI and Society. And there's a lot of in the press. What, in your view, is actually the question that matters the most, but we, we talk about least? And so if, uh, I mean, those are not necessarily the same, right? But, but what, what is, do we not talk about? Because there seems to be almost an industry of AI fear um, sort of bubbling up slowly, and we can maybe talk about that as well. But what, what is the real issue we're not that, that this draws our attention away from? And I see that you... Yeah, okay. I think there's basically, sort of essentially for human society, uh, two problems, uh, sustainability and inequality. So sustainability is about how do we deal with finite resources. Um, it's not just about, you know, two degrees Celsius. It would, not that that's unimportant, but in general, how do you fit people on a planet? How, how much biodiversity do you maintain that's not people? So there's those problems, and then Inequality, when we get to the level of inequality that we have right now, we tend to have lots of social disruption. And um, how this relates to AI is not as clear as we knew before, except for, as I said in my talk, that AI is an extension of human society, it is an extension of how we think. We have had inequality before. Right now, I don't think it's really the AI, I think it's ICT more generally, but it's allowing a lot of money to pile up in a few places. And I loved um, what, uh, uh, I don't know whether to say Martin or Professor Viterelli. <laughs> so, but I loved this thing about the cuckoo economy. There's a huge problem where people are supposedly giving away free services, but actually they're bartering data and they're not paying taxes. And so you have tech giants not paying taxes on the vast number of European citizens who are giving them data and getting from them services, right? So I think that that's the thing people aren't talking about. They aren't talking, you know, I think we do talk about the privacy issues yeah, that, and that, that's some of the other okay. things. Any other takers on this one, Chris? I think you. I, I had a, a thought on this. You asked, um, <clears throat> you didn't ask what's the most important problem. You said, what are, what are we not talking about that we should be talking about? Yeah. I think if you go back um, 10 years, maybe even five years, the big challenge was to get these things to work well. So mm -hmm. all of the discussion was about how to get the error rate down. Um, now we've got the error rate down. Now we have systems that are working um, very effectively in the real world, in many cases with the human level performance. We're seeing this tremendous excitement about real world applications. Then a whole host of new issues arise that we didn't have to worry about before because they didn't work. For example, um, adversarial issues. If you're going to put something out there in the real world, somebody somewhere is going to attack it. It needs to be robust to that. Questions around bias that we've heard about already, ethical issues. There are many, many dimensions. It's very good that we are talking about these a lot. They're tremendously important issues. We're discussing them a lot. In terms of something that we're not discussing enough, I think, it's the benefits which this technology can bring. Um, I just hear some echoes of the debate around genetically modified organisms and GM crops. That debate was discussed and conducted um, in a public way that was not well informed, that was very emotive. Um, and it had an outcome that many people would consider very undesirable in the sense that, yes, there are some very important concerns that we need to address, we need to understand those, but at the same time, we must recognize the tremendous benefits which these technologies can bring. And I think we do have to be very careful that with all of the, first of all, the scaremongering and the hype, but also the very real concern about some very important problems that we do need to address that we are talking about, we also are mindful of the fact that as a species, we face tremendous challenges in the 21st century and machine learning AI technologies could be helpful as one of the components of some of the solutions. And so I think we should also spend a little bit, bit of time talking about the potential benefits of the technology mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and we did a lot also yesterday. Maybe Martin, can you comment on this? Because here, of course, we're in a particular situation where people actually get to vote on these issues, whether we should do them or not. And with the GMO, that's exactly what's happened. Um, that we had a moratorium. Are, are you concerned about that there's going to be a moratorium uh, in Switzerland or other countries about this technology? And if so, how do you make that not happen? So, can I answer that question? Sure. After <laughs> I, I, I answer the first one you posed. Absolutely. <laughs> which, which I think is an important yeah. question. Nobody. <laughs> no, uh, actually, uh, people talk about this, but the most interesting question of AI 
it sounds a bit fluffy, but it's, uh, it poses fundamentally as a question what it means to be a human being. Because if you know, an AI program can essentially learn things in a, in a snap, um, you know, what, what distinguishes us from an AI program? Ultimately, not you know, today, like in 50 years, 100 years, or whatever. And uh, so the question I find interesting is, so stochastic gradient descent is what you guys use, right? And uh, we, if we believe the theory of evolution, we are roughly the product of a stochastic gradient descent of the last, you know, billion year. So a priori, there is no difference. Oops, did I say something you didn't want to hear? Uh, so, but that's really a fundamental question, right? So what does it mean to be a human? What will distinguish humans from, you know, extremely clever algorithms? And, uh, you know, will we be able to sort of regulate or, or master, you know, what will come out, the genie that comes out of the bowl? So that was answer to question number one. Yeah. Uh, the other one, I, I totally share the concern. So Switzerland, for those of you who are outside of, uh, come from outside, has a very interesting form of democracy, very direct, very, you know, could be very populistic at times, so risky. And uh, so things like GMO are actually voted on by the public. So there was a moratorium or it's a risk of a moratorium. And at the time, 90s, mid 90s, actually scientists got into the debate. Marcel, you probably remember this. Uh, scientists went into the streets to explain to the common citizen what uh, GM actually was and that it wasn't so bad. It was then voted down. And uh, currently we might have a similar problem. So at the end of the day, it's for us to go and explain to the general public what these technologies are, what are the benefits, what are the risks. Also be very honest about it. And I think that will clear the debate. Okay. Raya, can I, uh, first yeah. of all, give you the opportunity also to answer the question? And then on top of that, I mean, at DeepMind, I assume you're at the heart of this because you, you're very, uh, I mean, out there sort of in terms of showing, you know, be it AlphaGo or through video games, through things that people actually really understand. Yeah. Uh, are you, what's your experience there? Do you feel, is your impression that because you're much out there, you get a bigger understanding or, or an even bigger backlash from, from the public? Um, we've definitely had a mix of both. And I think that, uh, you know, I feel like most of the time, my role is in pulling us back from talking about, you know, dystopia or utopia, right? I mean, neither of these are realistic. The Terminator, uh, you know, um, vision does not make sense for many, many reasons. And, and also the utopian vision doesn't make sense for many reasons. So just, it may be boring, but sort of trying to, at DeepMind, we're really trying to pull back and talk concretely about what are the, um, you know, what, what, what makes sense policy-wise um, and what are the, you know, how do we, how do we talk about ethics and AI? Um, and these sorts of things. That's not the group that I work with, so I just want to, to make clear that, you know, I am not the uh, ethics and policy expert. <laughs> we do have a group at DeepMind that works on this. Um, I, I think that for me, one of the most important things that's wrong right now is to, that we do not have enough of the, uh, there are not enough AI researchers machine learning researchers that are focusing on the most important problems. There's this huge mismatch between the, the, the really, really smart PhD students who are graduating and what they're working on versus, I think, where the bulk of the, the most important problems are. There's very, very few people working on climate, but this could be a complete game changer in how we understand climate and how we understand how we can act to change, you know, to halt climate change. Um, inequality across the world you know, so why do we have so many um, wonderful, bright young students uh, and old students heading towards um, uh, startups that are sort of, uh, you know, do not have as much value, I think, as some of the, uh, the these most important problems. Um, and big companies, obviously, as focused on sort of social problems of social media rather than problems of um, of, of of the world. Sure, go ahead. I, I really want to, again, uh, jump to something that, uh, uh, can I say Martin? Okay, that, that Martin said uh, that uh, about humans. Um, 
So I, you know, I, I was a big Star Trek fan too when I was growing up. I, 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 uh, I spent a lot of time trying to think of a good coherent way where we could have robots to be part of our society. And um, I've been doing a lot of work on this. I've been working with uh, law professors and, and trying to understand uh, ethics. I work on uh, trying to understand human cooperation. I've come to the conclusion that every one of human value, uh, the, the values we have are the values of you know, enculturated apes. Everything that we think is important is our survival strategies. And it doesn't make sense for us to try to sort of offload this into uh, machines that would wipe us out. Um, and, and further, that the whole way that we've set up our system of justice is dependent on the fact that we have you know, uh, finite lifespans, finite resources, and that's how we deter people. So that's why jail and fines and things like that uh, uh, are, are used to, to try to create social order. So if we do think, even if it seems like a really nice convenience to, to uh, you know, a, a legal fiction like we have for corporations to make artificial intelligence like a driverless car responsible for its own liabilities, this just opens up this vast lacuna. It's like, it's like a uh, shell company on steroids because the reason that corporations our legal persons is because there are actual persons that really don't want them to go to jail or to lose their resources or whatever. And so when it, you have a shell company, it's when the people who are making the decisions don't care if that company goes away. Nobody's gonna care if a driverless car goes to jail, like nobody. And, and so that is not gonna be any kind of deterrent and it's, it's just a, a misuse of our society. So I actually think it's extremely important that we do not build machines that we are obliged to, that we don't uh, put things into that kind of context. And, and I do see the society needs to be human-centered in the future, um, or, or even uh, organic, you know, uh, environmentally centered. But I think it's a much better, this is not a necessity. We can make, I mean, the EU is thinking about setting laws that might be contrary to this, and that's why I was working with the law professors to try to just figure out how that should go. Mm -hmm. but, um, but this is a recommendation. I think that the best way to, to continue doing the things that we find valuable is, is to continue focusing on having humans in the middle of organizations, working with each other, always having a, a clear path between humans that talk to each other, and not to disintermediate humans by sticking uh, machines and calling them autonomous in between them. Mm -hmm. I just want to echo that maybe from a slightly different perspective. I think this um, partnership between humans and machines is something that we choose to do and it's a direction we choose. I think I'm agreeing strongly with Joanna on this one that um, there isn't an inevitability to this technology. In one sense it's inevitable just because there are so many people working on this and it's progressing so fast there are so many benefits. Uh, but as a society we can make choices and choosing to create a very human-centric AI is um, I think a very natural one. I find myself in a very happy position working at Microsoft because Microsoft's mission is about empowering people and empowering organizations. That's baked into, into everything we do. And so it's very natural to think about how uh, machines and humans working in partnership can empower people and make uh, mm -hmm. people more productive, make them happier, uh, address some of the big challenges of society. So it's, a, um, it's very much a design choice. And um, I'm an incurable optimist, I think, but I'm mm -hmm. very encouraged by the fact that if we look at the state of the art of the technology today, in sense it's very primitive compared to our aspirations. We talk about these grandiose visions, we have these very exciting, you know, real, real superb talk, hinted at some of the extraordinary capabilities that machines might have in the future. Today, of course, they're doing very, in a sense, very primitive things, and yet already we're having these discussions. So we do have a choice, we can remain in control. I don't think the Skynet phenomenon is ever going to be in, you know, where the machines just spontaneously take over, is, is ever going to become a reality, because we will, we will make conscious decisions about how we create and deploy the technology. Great. Ray, can I ask you also a personal question? As I mentioned, uh, when I introduced you, you have this background uh, in, uh, in religious study and philosophy. Does that uh, in any way shape your work today at DeepMind? Or no, that's gone and over? Um, for the most part, no. I would say the religion part of it, definitely not. But the philosophy side of it, I mean, obviously there's uh, wonderful thinkers that have for hundreds of years tried to understand things like perception um, and autonomy and, and very relevant subjects. And, you know, with, with varying degrees of success, depending on, on 
what philosophers you're a fan of, but I think that that's quite relevant to some of the ways in which we uh, interrogate our systems now. Um, you know, the, the, the architectures I've presented are huge in terms of their complexity and the number of parameters that we're training, and so we need to come up with new ways of testing and interrogating these systems to understand what the behaviors are, what they're reacting to in an environment, how they're making decisions. Um, and so I think that the, there, some of, the, some of the, the frameworks that philosophers have come up with are very relevant in terms of understanding from the outside uh, what is going on in a large, complex system. Yep. Okay, I have one more general question I would like to ask all of you, and then we'll open it up. So um, I think we've, we're all old enough that we've gone through uh, you know, one or multiple technology revolutions, and they keep coming faster anyways. Um, and to some extent, there are now those that say, okay, it's it's the same, right? It's There's nothing new. It's another technology revolution. It will um, destroy, you know, a bunch of jobs, as is inevitable in this sort of creative destruction, but it will create many more. And then I think... On balance, you always find that people who are well informed, especially um, on the technical side of things, tend to be that sort of optimist. What's interesting now, sort of looking from the outside, is that we suddenly have these obviously extremely talented technical people uh, like uh, Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking or Bill Gates that are super critical uh, and sort of cautious. So, would you by and large say, no, again? this time it's the same as before? Or is this time truly something different other than, okay, it's going a little faster, maybe too fast? Um, but is there something fundamentally truly different or would you say, no, by and large, this is, this is we're part of a historical pattern that's just continuing here? I'll answer it with, a, with another question, perhaps, because I'm, I'm no better qualified to predict the future than anybody else. But I think there's an interesting aspect to this, which is if you think about labor and about work, it serves multiple purposes. And one of the purposes, of course, has been traditionally to create the resources we need to survive. We used to have, you know, 200 years ago, a third of the population would work on the land to generate enough food to feed the population. Now it's down to 3% or even 2% with automation. Um, I think we may see a world in which or we can conceive of a world not so far off in which many of those um, uh, necessity-based um, um, requirements are sort of handle automatically. So the things that we need to do in order to provide uh, the food and shelter and things that we need um, can be enhanced enormously by automation, even to the extent where you start to think about uh, questions around the distribution of wealth and the creation of wealth. Uh, I think that, to me, that's a slightly different question from the nature of work and what we will actually do, because um, if, in that sense, I think AI, the AI revolution is perhaps not so dissimilar from what's gone before. That is, um, it seems likely to impact the nature of the work, for, of work very significantly across many, many different domains. And it's much easier to think of jobs that are destroyed than jobs that are created. It's, it's easy to think about how a tractor can replace several farm workers with one farm worker, but it's hard to think about AI research or a television presenter or new jobs that get created. So it's, it's, you, you tend to focus on the, the adverse effects. I think the positive effects can be enormous. I think a very interesting but rather speculative um, area is what happens as we approach a point in society where we no longer need to work in order to create the necessities for society. We work for other reasons. And then that raises questions about ownership of wealth and distribution of wealth, which, um, which I think are fascinating and open. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, this may be a qualitatively different technology from what we've seen before. All right. Interesting, Martin. Can I get your uh, point on that too? So, <clears throat> there is a famous paper by uh, the great economist John Maynard Keynes from the 30s, just after the, the Great Crisis, and he wrote this paper. It's about job opportunities for my grandchildren or something like this. And he says, oh, you know, there is all this automation coming and so on, so my grandchildren will work, I forget what, 12 hours a week, right? For some reason, it hasn't happened, okay? What has happened, you know, there is an unequal distribution of wealth, of income, and of work. I mean, there are fewer people that I think work harder and harder, like the people in Silicon Valley. And with the AI revolution, the big risk is that it's a winner-take-all, right? So the societies that are well-to-do, well-off, well-educated, etc., have, will have the technologies, for example, to bring back jobs from you know, uh, developing countries 
not into jobs in developed countries, but into automated factories and so on. So the Gini index, okay, which is already getting worse, uh, let's say, in, in, in our economy in, in the US, the Gini index between countries might actually also become worse because of that. Okay? And, and, and so it's sort of, it's hard to predict the future, but um, you know, usually, and I come back to my analogy to survival of the fittest, right? So somewhere, deep in the, not a deep mind, in the, there is a, a reptilian brain, and the reptilian brain is about survival of the, uh, the fistus, which is getting as many resources from competitors as possible, and that's how you know, societies still work, unless they are regulated by ethical and philosophical principles. And uh, there, I think, uh, another big change I see is that the last huge revolution, technological revolution, which you know, could destroy the world was the uh, invention of nuclear weapons, right? Everybody would agree on this. And nuclear weapons were essentially developed by governments and they were under the control of governments. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but the current you know, potential uh, weapons of mass transformation are actually owned by private companies and the private companies, you know, have another role to play in governments. And uh, so we have sort of not only let the cat out of the bag, but we gave the cat to another sort of uh, organizations. And there, I think society has to sort of think deeply about, you know, maybe taking back at least a little bit of control. Both of you. I'm just trying to figure out the order. Uh, okay. so. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the future of work because it was talked about before, but then there's some bigger, well, bigger other issues. Um, so uh, to, to slightly uh, now this time contradict a couple of the things that Martin said and said agree with. Uh, the, I, as I said, inequality is a big issue and it's a big issue in America, especially uh, the British. The French have been doing pretty well with it. And globally, the GD coefficient has been coming down. So all this technology we've been creating is actually helping people come to market that were previously isolated. So uh, I, th I think, I'm, I'm just, I did say, and I do believe that inequality is the biggest issue, but we solved the inequality problem disastrously badly last time. It took us a world war and a huge economic crash to in America get the elite to realize that inequality is bad for them too, and then they signed up. And unfortunately in Europe, of course, there was a second world war because of how bad the world, First World War had been solved, of course. Um, so we, but we know what we have to do. It's been done within living lifetime. We need to do it again. Uh, Tim O'Reilly has a great book about this stuff that's come out, and one of the people he quotes, I've forgotten who it was, says that history doesn't repeat itself, but it does tend to rhyme. And I, and I think we can take some of these things forward. So, but I'm gonna also extend a little further from what you said about this concern about corporations holding the technology. The two things that worry me are um, the fact that individuals do have so much more power. And I'm talking about individuals, not just corporations. Uh, this was brought more forward to my thinking um, at the Internet Governance Forum in Geneva, in fact, in December. Um, when somebody said that as somebody who does um, intelligence, like a military intelligence, not our kind of intelligence, uh, you couldn't conceive of someone taking such a large proportion of a country's information as Edward Snowden did, as one person did. You know, and that's not to say what, you know, whether that was good or bad, it's just that it's inconceivable how much power individuals have now. And, I, and so that worries me a little, although hopefully uh, as a network of individuals, we can figure out ways to damp down that threat um, but then the other problem is uh, the one that I meant, uh, sort of coming out of this thing about the machine, the one you mentioned of machine learning being able to predict and replace humans. We are, even though I, if we do uh, stay with the thing that Chris and I said was a good idea about having human-centric uh, society, the fact that humans are also algorithmic and that we can be predicted that's how the recommender systems work. You know, that's how all, you know, the, the Cambridge Analytica works. Um, we're gonna have to deal with the fact that we could be looking up our own best move on, on Google or someplace, you know, or sorry, or Bing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so I think there's a vast challenges for the humanities of helping people um, 
feel a strong self-image. And I'm sorry, I've been talking long, but one other thing, this thing about Keynes and 12-hour uh, work week, we could now work 17 weeks a year and be as well off as people were working 52 weeks a year a century ago. We choose not to. So that is something that we're, we're already in this situation. Again, it's not something that's coming because of AI. This is something we've been increasing and what we need is a little bit more self-awareness because it's increasing faster. Right, so I, I, I would just give my perspective from more down, you know, down in, in, in the uh, research science community, then I think that there are two, two things that, 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 that I need to point out. One is that all of the research institutions that are from academia to industry that are making significant headway in AI and machine learning are publishing everything that they're doing. I am 100% certain of that. There are certainly a few secretive startups out there, but I don't think that they're doing the interesting research right now. DeepMind, we published 50 papers, conference journal papers in the last year alone, and that's all of the groups that we have. We're publishing everything. OpenAI publishes everything. Google Brain publishes everything. So I think that, that that's, that's the biggest thing that we can do is to just simply put all of that progress out there. The other side of it is that the hype is way outrunning the actual technology. Um, and this, is the, this, this divide between the hype and the reality is only getting bigger. Um, and I think that you know, Elon Musk should know better. <laughs> He really should. He understands, he should understand how hard um, it is to get this technology right and to really get it to a point where, you know, a car can be autonomous uh, reliably. Um, Stephen Hawking, I'll give a pass to. He's not, he's not in, in the field. But anybody who's in the field understands that the technology has, still has a very, very long way to go. We are making progress, but I, I don't think it's out of control and I don't think it's something that we don't understand. And I think that the hype is, is uh, out of control right now. Chris, you wanted to add? Yeah, just actually, related to both comments, actually, and coming back to the point about um, you know, is, is the technology in the hands of a small number of large multinational corporations, what are the implications? I think it's worth just diving down a little bit into what is the, this technology, because it clearly has three components. The first one is there are algorithms, and as, as Ria emphasized, this is being developed, I mean, whether we like it or not, it's being developed in, an open, in a very open way. Um, we've seen companies recently, and Microsoft is not, Microsoft Research has always had a very open publication policy for a quarter of a century. We've seen other companies that traditionally have been less open and have not participated in that community come into that community and start to publish. I think people recognize, many organizations recognize, that you need to be operating in the open world. Yes, you give away some ideas, but you gain so much more. So it is just a simple fact that those algorithms are being developed in the open domain. They're available for everybody. So that's that's the first thing, that, that, that the algorithmic aspect is democratized. The second component of this technology is compute. And we've seen, uh, again, in Ria's amazing talk, the power of doing things at a very large scale with humongous amounts of compute. Um, that typically does reside in, in large corporations and is typically for sale. That's, there's a business model of selling uh, cloud computing effectively. And there's enough competition in that space that it's driving down costs and it's widely available. So I think access to compute is not going to be something that, I think that's something that is widely available. I think the real issue we should be addressing, of course, is the data. And the data is the, whether it's the oil or the gold or whatever it is. And that's the thing where we, we need to think about models for who owns the data, who, who, get, who gains value from that data? I think one domain that um, we probably don't have time to discuss in detail, but I think brings a lot of these things into very sharp focus is the healthcare domain. It's sometimes been called the sleeping giant of AI. One of the areas where AI machine learning could really transform society in a very, very positive ways is in the domain of healthcare. And we should think about where the data reside, who, who owns the data. If it's, if it's your healthcare data, surely it's your personal data. It shouldn't belong to somebody else for commercial exploitation by somebody else. Yes, they should create value from it, and of course they should be rewarded for doing so. But ultimately, it's our personal data. But it's not, it's not that simple, of course. Machine learning benefits from analyzing large collections of data. So we have to, we have to address some very thorny questions about how to analyze very large bodies of data while being very cognizant of the ownership of the data and where the value flows. Very interesting. Yep. Uh, little, uh, I, I, I keep not uh, talking about what Chris is saying because I agree with everything. So <laughs> there's no point. So I'm, I'm going to disagree with Ria uh, slightly. I totally agree that there's too much hype, but I don't like saying um, 
it's too far into the future to worry about. I think we can look at the trends and talk about what we need to do in terms of regulation. Um, so, so while I, I do agree that there's some really weird things going on with, with uh, Musk and, and Hawking and whatever, I, I, uh, I don't like that shape of argument. Um, and and I, th coming back to what you just said, I think this is really important. Some people are saying that maybe AI should be seen as a utility. Um, and I don't, I don't see that. AI is a lot of creativity. Every, all these little companies are making these really great contributions. I absolutely loved the uh, industrial talk. Was that Bueller? That, that, that was earlier, it was fantastic. And you know, every company has a contribution to make there, but data is more like the ecosystem. Ultimately, there's only one world. And so that I can see that there's a real issue about who owns the data and whether that's really a public good and we need to figure out how to uh, uh, distribute it. All right, so I could go on forever, but as promised, we're now opening it up. So if we could have just a little bit of light and also, that's really the benefit of sitting in the front. We'd see you better when you raise your hands, as you noticed yesterday. But OK, where is the microphone going first? We see lots of questions. And um, please try to keep your question as to the point and short as you possibly can, so we can squeeze in as many as possible. Hi. Um, I'm Diego Saldana. I work at Novartis. Um, um, and I'm, I, I work also in machine learning. So. Uh, I had a question that was, I think is relevant to the conversation that you were having. Uh, so um, I think after s conversations with people who don't work in, in machine learning and who don't have exposure to the topic, um, I realized that I'm often, well, and I was often taking the same position uh, that, well, it's also going to create a lot of jobs and it's kind of a matter of educating people. But I realized at one point that it's kind of easy to, I mean, for a person who works in machine learning, to think that it's very easy to learn these things um, and to not uh, think about the possibility that, you know, just like many people cannot, even if they try hard, many people cannot become a professional soccer player or a professional basketball player. And in, the, in that same way, uh, many people cannot, even if they try very hard, cannot become a, a machine learning expert. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering what is your opinion on, on that idea that, yep. you know, even if we, if we create a lot of jobs, maybe there's not a lot of people who can fill in those positions. Who's going to do it? Yeah. I think I'm okay. going to pass that on. And, uh, but let me just open with, with Martin. I think you um, have some views on that. Well, just register at EPFL or at the extension school. It's a done deal. Uh, no, I mean, it's just like, I mean, you, you took soccer players. Uh, not everybody can play the cello, like what we heard earlier. And not everybody can be Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, it's sort of obvious, right? And so the question is, um, it comes back to my, my pet peeve, which is, uh, what does it mean to be a human? It's probably to be a uh, creative human being, and that's not only being a machine learning specialist, right? There are many creative uh, opportunities, and certainly in relationship, uh, in relationship type of works, there is, well, would I want to be taken care of by a robot? Uh, I mean, I know it's being done, but uh, I, it's not a world I would like to inhabit. So I, I think one has to, has to think much broader into what type of occupations there will be, I'm not saying it's an easy answer, and I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I'm rather an optimist on this one. But I think it's, as a society, we should think about what type of occupation will be rewarded in you know, this new world that will be ushered in by AI. I'm just going to give a, a little anecdote, a quote that I read recently in a great journal called The La, uh, Die Republique. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a story of... I, I'm not sure it's true, but it's a good story anyway, I think, is uh, Henry Ford presents some automated factory to the head of the union, uh, you know, of the auto workers union. And Henry Ford says, oh, look, all these robots, you know, they're not going to pay their union dues to the unions. And the head of the union says, yeah, but these robots are not going to buy your cars either. Yeah, so um, there, there's two things I want to say that are quite different from each other. First of all, uh, it's not clear that machine learning is the best job of the future because we will also get better at figuring out how to program with programs. 
So, so I don't think this is something that, that we can just say oh, academics are automatically off the hook or whatever. There's, uh, people are going to think about how to automate all kinds of things. But secondly, on the other hand, uh, I think you know, the people in this room, most of us know or feel pretty strongly that if we, if we lost our job, we would probably find another job. And, and if we didn't, we'd start our own company. We'd figure out some way to make a living. And I'm now living in a relatively rural setting, uh, and that it really reminds me the importance of community. And I think this is part of why inequality is, works the way it does. If you give people money, they love nothing more than to spend it employing other people. I mean, it's partly about us being apes, and we like to have dominant structures. And you know, we all like it that somebody else has to clean up our, our toilet for us, and that guy likes how much he makes from being able to clean up toilets, right? And it's, it's uh, I don't mean clean up, you know, fix. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, there, so I think this is why inequality is really important. We need to get money out uh, where people can uh, be innovative, come up with their own businesses, and some of these are going to be skilled work, and some and some people are not going to have, uh, they, they, they are going to be easily, more easily replaceable, so they will have relatively low wages, which is why we need strong social networks, too, to make sure they still have things like health care that in America you don't necessarily get. Is it, that's also sort of reflecting on this discussion that we're having with, oh, okay, the most frequent job in most of the U.S. states is truck driver, uh, an inherently automizable job at some point, bit of a discussion when and where, but we sort of agree. Check out, cashier, what have you. Is that is that something that's very different that we're now just will will be faced with overnight destruction of jobs at in, in a very short time and that'll be hard to deal with from a economic uh, social perspective? I think that there, you, you touch on an interesting point. There is one aspect that's a little different this time around is the, the, the rapidity of the change. I think about the agricultural revolution. It happened over the course of a generation. So you were a farmer. Perhaps you realized that your children weren't going to be farmers. But there was more time to adapt. And I think the increasing rapidity of the change presents us with extra stresses and challenges on the system. So in, in that sense, it's qualitatively, qualitatively different, but perhaps it's qualitatively different because it's the one generation, somebody would have imagined they had a career in a certain field and then they will be impacted by this technology and we'll, we'll, we'll need to think about that. So I think the, the, the very short timescales may make it a little different this time around. All right, let's take another question. Thank you. A modest core of Basel, again. Um, we have seen yesterday two robot arms which were nicely catching um, a flexible bar. Um, today we have seen a um, computer playing Atari games, but this game, there were, as far as I've seen it, there were no game where collaboration was needed. So are you training your reinforcement learning also for collabor collaborative games, like I only know the expression in German, Mensch ärgere dich nicht. <laughs> Maybe somebody can translate. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'm French I, speaking. Somebody no, should t tell me what that translates to. But um, I can say, so we do have a group that's led by Tore Greppel, um, at, um, at DeepMind that focuses on multi-agent uh, learning problems. And so there the question is, you put uh, multiple agents in different types of, of games and you can construct a lot of interesting sort of ethical dilemmas actually in, in, in this sort of way or different ways to, you know, as, as resources uh, decrease, then do you get more... Um, do you get war emerging um, and uh, th things like this, but also looking at teamwork um, and how that emerges. So a, a lot of, there's some interesting research there. Um, the other way in which we use multiple agents is simply by self-play, but that's more, maybe a special case of being able to train um, in uh, alpha zero, alpha go, alpha, alpha chess, these different um, domains to train a single network by having it learn via self-play, but that's not explicitly having multiple agents. Um, I think that having, um, there's a lot of interesting research that's been done with multiple robots all the way from the swarm type of approaches and understanding how flocks and swarms work in nature and that how that can translate into uh, algorithms for robots, uh, but also in reinforcement learning, how we can get these sorts of structures emerge. Uh, 
Um, I have not done any work myself on it, mainly because of um, the complexity of the, the plumbing and the robotics and the safety and things like that involved. Um, but it's something that I'd like to do. Uh, I don't know how, whether this has been tested again recently, but it was certainly the case, uh, at least until fairly recently, maybe it still is the case, that if you take the game of chess and you look at the who, you know, what is the world's strongest chess player, um, obviously it's not a human because ever since Kasparov lost the deep blue, it's been a machine. But actually it turns out it's not a machine either. It's a machine and a human playing together. It's called a centaur, and that can be a machine and uh, a human. And is a reflection of the fact that there's a complementarity, at least today, between what machines do and what, what humans do, the way the way the brain seems to work, the way machines currently work. Um, and in a way, it's a little unfortunate that the term AI has been been used. I think there are really two things happening. I think there's a, an aspiration to produce very general intelligence in machines, which is intellectually a fascinating aspiration. Uh, it's been around certainly for seven decades since Turing. I think we're all agreed that we're not quite there yet. And most of us would say we, we seem to be a very long way there. We've, we've taken a few percent of the, of the path down the road. Um, meanwhile, machine learning techniques that we have today are proving to be extremely useful in a whole, whole range of different uh, um, application domains. And we, we anticipate a big impact on society, hopefully mostly positive. Um, but I think it is the case that the machines today work in rather different ways and have different strengths and weaknesses compared to the human brain. And so um, machines working in partnership with people, empowering and augmenting people, um, is the most powerful combination that we have right now. I wouldn't want to speculate what things look like in decades to come, um, but right now that centaur, that, uh, that uh, machine that's empowering a person is, um, feels like that really is the direction we should go because of that complementarity. So maybe we should rename AI as added intelligence. That would be a better, a better pitch. But I, I do finally disagree about something. I, I, I think we've already passed uh, human level intelligence. I, I don't think it's something that's way distant down the road. I, <laughs> we, we've done, we are superhuman in so many different domains. And I actually just saw a really brilliant talk, and I cannot remember the name of the person who gave it, unfortunately. But the, in terms of like the processing per energy, even, we're getting to the point where we're superhuman. But we're not going to see something that is exactly Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're just not. We, unless we clone humans and have all the biological needs and requirements and lifestyles or whatever, you're not going to put all the pieces together to make a person. And why would you? There's 8 billion. So, so I, I don't think that the problem is like some technological problem. So, as you know, Nick Bostrom has this um, picture. It's a, it's a line, and it's in labeled intelligence. And you have a sort of a, an insect and a, and a mouse and a chimpanzee and a person. And he points out that um, you know it goes, it, there's nothing special about human intelligence. It's just where evolution's got to right now. Uh, and there's no reason to believe you couldn't have intelligence that are way beyond human. And um, while I don't disagree with that, I, the problem I have is that it's just one line. And intelligence has many, many dimensions. So if we take and the ability to multiply two numbers together. That is a form of intelligence, I would argue. It's a kind of information processing. And uh, you know, my cell phone, it way exceeds my ability to multiply numbers together in terms of speed and accuracy. So along some dimensions, we've had for a long time um, uh, information processing capabilities that way exceed humans. And in other dimensions, um, humans way exceed anything that machines can do today. So um, I can strongly agree with you and strongly disagree at the same time, I think. <laughs> Okay, well, and just one other piece of that. I totally agree about that, you know, mice are better than us at things and monkeys are better than us at some things. Monkeys are more recently evolved than we are. We did not evolve from monkeys. They were, as I said, out competing us before we got writing. Did I say that here? That we, we, there were more uh, macaques than there were hominids up until writing 10,000 years ago, okay? Yeah. So, so uh, there's a lot more about intelligence, but there's a lot more about being human than just intelligence. It's just like we have a height, we have an IQ, we, we have the very various kinds of intelligence, we have a weight, we have a lack of capacity to fly. I mean, and that was what I was saying before about human justice. That's not just about intelligence. I'm not saying you couldn't make an a AI lawyer. I'm saying that, well, you could make an AI that is very good at, an AI device is very helpful in executing the law but you couldn't make something that meaningfully uh, suffers from being thrown into jail. So Martin, is that when you say, okay, we, we just uh, have to continue to think about what it means to be human, is that what you mean by it? I mean, uh, some kind of static notion or what it means to be humans in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, when we get the newer link, what does it mean to be human then? Or is it in that context how you mean it? 
I, it was in the philosophical sense. So, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, since AlphaGo was mentioned, which is a, you know, fantastic advance, uh, but AlphaGo didn't, didn't invent Go, right? Humans invented Go. And humans have fun playing Go. I'm not sure AlphaGo has a lot of fun playing Go. Uh, <laughs> I, I know you can ask a question, but... Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm obsessed with this notion of creativity. So, speaking of many dimensions, I hope the one that, you know, we can still excel, but it's a challenge, is the one on creativity. Because the other ones, multiplying numbers and so on, uh, will have added, you know, pieces to the brain or something, and that will be just fine. But there must be something, I hope, absolutely unique about uh, about being a human. Right, you respond if you want to, you have a, a year. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that the, the, uh, the, the, the biggest difference between what we're able to achieve in terms of superhuman performance on specific tasks and biological intelligence is just the generality of uh, the flexibility of human intelligence and animal intelligence to respond to new situations and to be creative, to be diverse, um, and to reason through, through a problem. And, you know, ravens do an amazing job at this as well. I think that humans are differentiated by the length of time that uh, they can reason about something, they can reason into the future about uh, consequences and such. Um, but, you know, to, to go back to a previous question at all, cause, uh, as well, because I think it's related, the question is whether or not any human can be can retrain to become a machine learner or to contribute in sort of a new new technology, um, and I think that absolutely that they can. I mean, not every human can become a pro footballer, but every human, you know, sort of average human can play football, can learn to do these different things, um, can learn to write code, uh, you know, can learn to do the the amount of math that's required to, um, you know, to put together. Uh, a, you know, an, an approach and uh, train a network and do some of these things. Um, at the extremes, of course, you need some extreme focus and, and maybe some sort of innate talents. But in general, we are incredibly flexible, general uh, intelligence, in, uh, you know, beings with, in, with intelligence. And um, that's the incredibly powerful thing. And that's what we're not coming close to touching with uh, even our most advanced AI methods. Yeah, I agree we're probably substantially underestimating the, the capability of a, a very broad segment of the population to pick up some of these right. skills. Well, I'll agree with that, but I still disagree that, I mean, even just look at the other animals, look at the, the spectrums of light. With machines, we can see every aspect of light. Humans are specialized to a particular spe you know, spectrums of light that even other animals can see and we can't see. That, that we're, we're highly specialized. We're not general. And you say we're general because like, oh yeah, we can learn games that were invented so we could learn them. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can like be released in the vacuum of space and do anything competent. So I, you know, I, I, I think there's a, it's not this uh, uh, dichotomy that's being presented. More questions? I don't make the choice, other people make the choice. Hello? Right, go ahead, whoever has the mic has the power. Okay, so thank you for all the discussion. You quite answer the question that I want to make. And um, it's about the development of the AI themselves, uh, in particular from two aspects. Because uh, we say we don't want to build our robots that is um, a human, but you want the robots to uh, be able to play Go, be able to walk. And uh, so my question about these two aspects is uh, if you want to build uh, robots that are representative of uh, the human being, so uh, try to build uh, um, uh, an artificial intelligence that is uh, unbiased. And uh, eventually my question related to that is uh, how to check it uh, if uh, the artificial intelligence itself is not creating its own bias in order to generalize the world uh, around itself. And um, the second aspect uh, is uh, if instead we want to build a sort of uh, superhuman, but not human, as a, more as an alien, as a superman. So we not take in consideration all the human characteristics, but more uh, focused on the problems that are actually in, uh, in the humanity and eventually 
if uh, it's connected to research like the um, Institute of Future or Open Philanthropy, where there is a research on what are the most uh, important uh, problems to solve in this uh, age. So this, so I give you the uh, yeah. So I'll answer quickly for DeepMind first, which is that so the the official or maybe it's the unofficial, but the the motto of DeepMind is solve intelligence and then use it to solve everything else, right? And the idea is that you know we're trying to understand human intelligence. That's why we're focusing on all of these things involving different human capabilities. That's why we focus on gameplay, because in the breadth of different games in which humans play, basically that encompasses, that covers the breadth of, of human ability. Uh, at least, you know, there's, there's a, um, an, a big enough overlap there that it means that gameplay is really important for us, from physical games uh, to go to, to all sorts of things. Um, so we want to understand human intelligence, but not so that we can build a super, not so we can build a a human AI, build something to replace or, or compete with humans. It's so that we can solve um, the most important problems and the things that are complex enough that humans are, have not been able to to solve them, or we're not solving them quickly enough. And we feel like that if we can develop um, intelligence. Um, that is like humans, that we will be able to attack some of these problems, but have things like the, um, be able to bring in the amount of data that's required to look at um, financial inequality, for instance, as a, a major problem, or health as a major problem, or um, climate as a major problem. That's where we want to focus on, uh, but it goes hand in hand with understanding intelligence. Um, I think somebody asked, Demis Hassabis, who's the founder of uh, DeepMind and uh, the, the, the CEO, whether he would, if he had to choose whether to create artificial intelligence or to understand the human brain, which would he rather, <laughs> which would he rather have? He said, well, of course, I'd rather understand the human brain. Um, so to him, fundamentally, that's the most important thing is to understand our intelligence. But then the second step is to solve the hard problems. I, I totally agree with Ria. I just want to say two things uh, to, to, for clarification again still. Intelligent doesn't mean human-like, right? So, so we, can make, we can create a whole lot of intelligence. It's not that then there's these other things we have to negotiate with. If we do create human-centered AI and we, and we do legally say that, that we are the, the actors, then we're talking about us solving the problems using these prosthetics. And we've been doing that, again, ever since writing. So we have been solving. That's what universities are for, right? We're solving all kinds of problems. And with AI, we will solve the problems faster. It's not that we're handing the problems to AI. So I, I just want to keep that clear. There's a really interesting paper published um, about nine months ago, I think. It made the front cover of Nature, which was looking at using a deep convolutional neural net to classify skin lesions according to whether they're cancer or benign. Um, and various interesting things emerged from this. The first one is that it was a, a, a deep network that was trained on uh, image net data, so just pictures of airplanes and mushrooms and things. And then the top was ripped off and the top was retrained using uh, a limited data set of, um, nevertheless quite a large data set of uh, classified human labeled skin lesions. Um, and it made the front cover of Nature because it achieved the same accuracy as the best human dermatologist and was better than most human dermatologists. So that made the front cover of Nature. One interesting thing is um, those dermatologists are professional. They've been trained. They've spent many years in training. It's hard to imagine that dermatology is going to get much better over the years because they're already at sort of the limits of what they can do. This, this dumb network was pretty, you know, it was pretty hacked together. So you can imagine, get a lot more data, train it properly on skin data, not on cars and mushrooms. Rooms, um, you can imagine that it's just crossing a threshold, it's going to get a whole lot better. So I discussed it with a dermatologist friend of mine, <clears throat> as you can imagine in the dermatology community this was creating quite a lot of buzz. Um, he was very excited about it. I asked him if he was, he felt threatened by this and at the end of his career, and not at all. He was hugely, he was really excited to see this get translated into clinical practice. He, he has people come in with um, obviously, you know, 
blots and so on on the skin. And he needs to figure out, is this just a cosmetic thing and you can get it sorted out if you want to? Or is that this life-threatening? Do we need to do something? And he wants to make the right decisions. And if he's got something which can inform that decision-maker and help him or her make better decisions, it was a him in this case, uh, then that's something only to be welcomed. And so it, it augments their, their capability. At the end of the day, you go and see your dermatologist and they say, they'll scan it with a, with a camera, the deep neural network will come up with various probabilities and will guide them and they will say, well, actually, I think in this case, there's a, a high, you know, a 50%, 80% probability that this is uh, precancerous, we need to treat it. You want that communication to happen with a human, at least I do. I don't want an app on my phone telling me I've got cancer and then that's it, right? I want, a, <laughs> I want to have a conversation low. with a person about what happens next. <laughs> we have a great talk this afternoon by Cibramed co-founder who, who is now offering that for one dollar. So that's going to make some people unhappy, I think. Others very happy. Okay, we have time for one brief last question, um, and then unfortunately we have to wrap this up. Uh, so hello, um, I'm Pavel here. There. And uh, I'm organizing a machine learning meetups in Lausanne. And one of the problems which I found was to invite like people 50 plus um, and very skilled engineers who are just a little bit threatened by the development of AI. So do you have a specific proposition for those people, how to put them in a circle, how to involve them in the development? General question of diversity. So I can, I'm not sure how to turn this into a, a, a general, uh, into general advice, but I will throw out the example of my mother who spent um, her, most of her working uh, years till she was 60 something as a potter, as a ceramicist, artist making pots every day, lots of them, selling them. Um, and uh, uh, when she was 62 or so, she literally stole my computer graphics textbook, taught herself to program, and started writing little, uh, you know, a shareware program, which then turned into a uh, smartphone game, which has become popular. And she still makes uh, a lot of different games. She loves little logic puzzles. So she made this game called uh, Path Picks that's become quite popular. And, uh, you know, so now she's in her mid-70s, and she sometimes has people send her their CVs because they think that she's a whole company. But no, she's just one person who taught herself how to program and jumped onto, um, onto the, uh, you know, iPhone early enough to throw an, an app out there and have it be successful. And I just feel like all that took was her feeling like there, there, wasn't, that there wasn't a limit, that, there, that, that she could give this a try. And I think what it takes is a certain amount of, of space and um, you know, comfort she didn't have to, she needed to not feel like, oh, she, she, she had to, uh, you know, pay the rent that month. You need to have that space in your life to be able to have the risk of trying something new. But I, I really think that anybody can uh, do exactly that, teach themselves to write code and try out very new things. Um, and people should do this. I was just going to make a comment, <clears throat> touch, uh, broaden it slightly and, and re think about the digital divide and how to bridge that divide, which is the responsibility which I believe those of us who are in research in, in technology in this domain have to, um, to not just communicate as a one-way process, but participate in a dialogue and a discussion with society in general about what the technology does and doesn't do, partly to avoid the issues we talked about earlier around GM and misunderstanding of the technology and the hype and some of the scaremongering, which I think is very misplaced, um, but generally to um, have a more participatory discussion amongst society. I think actually, even, even, even if we are animals seeking to maximize our rewards and all the rest of it, I think there's a, a strong self-interest to make sure that society as a whole participates in this, um, both in the dialogue and in the benefits of the technology, because I think that benefits, benefits all of us. So I think there is a responsibility not just to, to create the technology, but also be willing to engage in a dialogue at a level that people are willing to engage with. So it's not at a deep technical level. It's about uh, not in precise how the technology works, but what it can do, what it can't do, what its limitations, what its potentials are. 
um, I do believe we have responsibility to to take that very seriously. This is this is just speculation to take back to your group, but I was thinking of a similar story to the one we just heard that's more beautiful than mine. But it may be that uh, that if the older people are feeling threatened, it's because they don't see their children or grandchildren um, getting work. So it may be a larger problem. Because yes, when I got good in it, then also my grandparents took it up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but they they don't sell anything. <laughs> Parting, parting words, Martin. No, it's not parting words. Just uh, a minute of advertising for uh, Marcel Salaté's <laughs> program. Uh, no, but more seriously, uh, we were very, we are very concerned about the digital divide. We see the responsibility of an institute like ours, not only to teach, uh, you know, bachelor, masters, and PhD students, but also to engage with society. And uh, this particular program that uh, Marcel launched was really to answer this question for really the question you pose, people in their 50s who may or may not have an engineering degree, but are feeling that maybe their skill set is not exactly the one that is most in demand. And uh, it's an experiment. Um, I'm sure Marcel will tell us more in a year at the Applied Machine Learning Days. How about that? Sounds good. All right, then I will speak some parting words, and that is to, I think, on behalf of the audience, if I may express our deep gratitude to all of you for a wonderful morning, really great insights, and your time to be on this panel and answer questions. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking. Thank you.